like to welcome everyone today. And if you're a guest with us today, we welcome you. We are so glad to have you in service with us today. If you're watching us online, wherever you're joining us from, we pray that you are blessed by this service today as well. In Jesus' name. I'm going to go to Leviticus chapter number 21. We'll begin reading with verse number 16, Leviticus 21, verse number 16. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generations that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. That's a pretty scary statement. Let anyone of your seed that has a blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of Israel. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach blind man, a lame man, he that hath a flat nose, or any other. I have two words that I struggle to pronounce correctly. This is the second one. Yeah, superfluous. I've told it's not superfluous, so. <laughs> or a man that is broken-footed or broken-hearted or crook-backed or a dwarf or hath a blemish in his eye or be scurvy or scabbed or hath stones broken. No man, no man that hath a, ble a blemish, a blemish, a blemish of the seed of Aaron, the priest shall come nigh to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He hath a blemish. He shall not come nigh to offer the bread of his God. He shall eat the bread of his God, both of the most holy and of the, of the holy. Only he shall not go in unto the veil, nor come nigh unto the altar, because he hath a blemish, that he profane not my sanctuaries, for I the Lord do sanctify them, Moses told it unto Aaron and to his sons and, to unto, and unto all the children of Israel. This, my title is going to make basically no sense right now, but by the time we get done, it will. I want to preach to you this morning on the message of the manger. The message of the manger. Father, thank you for your wonderful, awesome presence that has been manifested in this place already. Lord, as we have lifted up your name, you have responded to our praise and our worship by manifesting your presence in this place and touching hearts and lives. I believe you've already ministered to people in this sanctuary today, but I believe you're not finished, and I believe, God, you want to speak to somebody's heart today. You want somebody to hear a message that comes from you. Not a sermon, Lord, because that's what we expect as a part of a church service, but a message that comes from you and finds someone exactly where they are. I trust you that you will do that here this morning. I depend on you today, Jesus. I acknowledge that without you I can do nothing. I trust you. For your anointing this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. For those of you who may not be very familiar with the context and the things going on with regards to these verses, let me just try to give you a really, really brief summary, because this is a topic you could spend weeks and months delving into and still not really comprehensively study at all. 
children of Israel are in their process. They had spent 400 plus years in bondage in Egypt and God uses Moses to help lead them out and God manifests his miraculous power to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. And in this process, God is beginning to establish things for their future. This, it's in this time frame that God gives the law, what we often think of as the Ten Commandments, but there were hundreds of commandments that God actually gave to the children of Israel. And so this is a part of the establishing of all of that. It's, it's a part of God gave Moses instructions to build a tabernacle, a place that the presence of God would dwell. It would represent the dwelling place uh, amongst the people of God for the Spirit of God. And so in the process of this, God gives very specific instructions about all of it. He gives very specific instructions about how it's to be built, the the, the, the materials to be used, the furniture that goes in it, what kind of metals are to be used for the different types of furniture and, and uh, it, it, the colors of it. And I mean, he just gives really, really minute details. He doesn't really leave anything up to Moses to do whatever he wants to do. And then he gives instructions on the service, what's supposed to take place in the tabernacle and and then also who it is that is supposed to be the ones conducting that service. And so the priests were a very significant part of the, the children of Israel. And according to Scripture, they come from the, they come from the tribe of Levi. Levi. They're the Levites. And, and Aaron was the high priest. And so it's, it's in this process that the, that the verses I read to you take place where God speaks to Moses who is then supposed to tell Aaron these details that if there's any of your descendants that have these issues or a blemish, they don't have to have several of them, just one of these or, or others, a blemish, they are not fit to conduct the service. They are not fit to go into the... The, the holy place, the holy of holies. Again, he says that they can, they can eat the bread, but they can't, they can't be a part of the service and the ministry that's taken place there. There are really in probably any passage, anything in Scripture, there are, there are layers to what, God is communicating through that particular scenario, that particular verse. There's, there's a primary application, the main thing God is doing and saying, but, but then there are some other applications, and, and I don't think any one is less important than the other. I don't think it's that the primary application is the most important. It's just kind of the main thing. But then there's other things to be gleaned from that, that again, the story, the verse, whatever. And I, I believe this is one of those things, that there is a whole... Uh, a component of this that what God is doing and, and what it has to do with in that moment in time. But then there's this, this other application and it's really that other application or one of the other applications that I'm here to preach to you about this morning. In essence, God made it to be exclusive. He established it in such a way that this service that was to take place was not a whomsoever will. And when he gives these requirements that, that if there's any blemish, if there's any of these issues, that that person is not fit for this service, he really narrows down who can be a part. I, I acknowledge if that was the end of the story, then you could maybe have an issue with God. If that's where He left it all, then, then He's unjust and He's unfair. But that isn't where He left it all. But here's part of the point, I believe, 
you, you can't really appreciate some things unless you have some perspective. You, you, you can't understand the significance of what you and I have available to us today. You can't really understand the access that you and I have today if, if you don't understand another side to it. So I don't think that God was here trying to say that or show that he was, he was prejudiced or he was partial. But, but God knew from the very beginning what the ultimate plan was. God knew from the very beginning what he was eventually going to do. God is the, if I could say it this way, is the master of chess players. I know how to play chess. I know how the pieces on the board move. But to call me a chess player would be really... My strategy, when I, I haven't played chess in probably decades, literally. But when I did play some, my strategy was, you know, looking around the board and feeling sorry for the guys that hadn't moved all game. It's not fair. They're just sitting there, same spot. They ought, they ought to get to move some. I understand a little bit about a person that really knows how to play chess. They are, they are moves ahead. They don't, they don't make each move in the moment. They're, they know where they're going. And can I tell you what is amazing is that from the beginning of time, from the very beginning of time, God knew every move He was going to make. He knew every move He would make in a, in a, in a, uh, a worldwide, uh, big picture perspective. But He also knew every single move in your life individually. There are things in every one of our lives that catch us by surprise, that catch us off guard. But I can tell you today, in all of history, there has never been one single thing, not one single thing that has caught God off guard. God knew everything in advance, and according to everything that was to come, God had a plan and a purpose for every single thing. So when God says, hear what He says about no blemishes, and basically what He's saying is, if you're going to be a part of the service in my temple, in the tabernacle, basically He's saying you've got to be perfect. Which disqualifies most people. I, I would venture to say that, uh, that there were Maybe it was implied that there was other things besides this list, that it wasn't necessarily a conclusive list, but even if this was the, the, the precise exact list, that, that's, there's some things on here that are kind of broad. And so it was easy to be disqualified. I, I know I'm kind of going slow here this morning, but stay with me. It was very easy to be disqualified from the service of the Lord. It was, it was very easy to be disqualified from going into the holy place, the most holy place. It was easy. It wasn't a difficult thing to become disqualified. It was, it was a pretty simple thing. I mean, these are not, you know... You're, those stories of people that, you know, there, there's, there's 20 people in the entire world that have been diagnosed with a certain disease. It's rare. These aren't rare things. <laughs> These are not necessarily rare things. There's some things in this list that are relatively common. That disqualified the leave. It didn't matter if they were born into the right family. It didn't matter if they had the right lineage. If they had these issues, they are disqualified. But I believe part of the reason God did that was for you and I to be able to appreciate. 
what we have today, there had to be some perspective of the value of it. That what we may take for granted here today, there was a period of time you didn't take it for granted. Because to have an understanding of the significance of what God was going to do, you had to understand what it had been. And what it had been was, it wasn't whomsoever will just come. It was very restrictive. Really, in a lot of other ways, it was very restrictive. This is just kind of one of the big examples we go to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 1 says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came three wise men from the east to Jerusalem. doesn't say there were three wise men. Not that it's whatever, but we, we sing some songs as if they're gospel truth. <laughs> Only thing I can think of is because the Bible says they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh, we must think that there were three guys with each individual gifts. Anyway. We three kings of Orient are saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Barnes note says with regards to this term, the wise men, the original word here is magi, from which comes our word magician, now used in a bad sense, but not so in the original. The persons here denoted were philosophers, priests, or astronomers. They lived chiefly in Persia and Arabia. They were learned, they were they were the learned men of the Eastern nations, devoted to astronomy, to religion, and to medicine. They were held in high esteem by the Persian court. They were admitted as counselors and followed the camps in war to give advice. They were probably some guys, some men, who fit the qualifications of what Jesus told, or what the Lord told Aaron, or Moses. They probably were okay with that list, that they didn't have those things. They were, they were esteemed, they were respected, they... They, 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 were, they were looked up to by many people. They, they had it together. But notice they were seeking Him. They had to go find Him. The offerings here, Barnes Notes also says, referred to were made because they were the most valuable which the country of the magi or wise men produced. They were tokens of respect and homage which were paid to the newborn king of the Jews. They evinced their high regard for him and their belief that he was to be an illustrious prince. And the fact that their deed is recorded with approbation shows us that we should offer our most valuable possessions are all to the Lord Jesus Christ. Wise men came from far to do Him homage and bowed down and presented their best gifts and offerings. They they presented what what was very valuable, the most valuable things from their country. They are the ones that would have been at the top of the guest list for the party. They're the ones that everybody wanted to be there. However, they had to seek Him for themselves. Oh, I'm not devaluing the fact they were seeking Him. Not 
devaluing the significance that they were interested enough to find him, but they had to do it themselves. They had no personal invitations. There was no one that invited them. They initiated their journey. But here's a whole different thing. Luke chapter 2, verse number 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto who? Unto us. Not who he had made known unto the esteemed, distinguished wise men. That's not the ones that got the angelic visitation. That's not the ones that had this great sign to tell them what to do and where to go. It was just a bunch of shepherds who were viewed as the very common people of the day. In fact, I, I, one commentary I read said some th- and, 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 and in an effort not to offend anyone here today, if somebody happens to be in one of these industries, I'm not going to call any specifics, but basically they were saying that, that, that a shepherd in that day, was it was one of the most menial jobs. It was the lowest of positions. And yet it was them that the angels appear to and say, Unto you, unto you, you common shepherds, you smelly shepherds, you dirty shepherds, you don't have gold and frankincense and myrrh. You don't have any valuable gifts to bring to the manger. But the ones who are getting the invitation to the manger is the shepherd, not the wise men. And if I understand the order of Scripture correctly, the ones that got to the manger first was not the wise men. The ones that visited the manger first was the shepherds. Because the message of the manger is this thing is not intended to be exclusive. This thing is not intended to keep people out. This thing is not to be done in a way that there's only a small few that ever have a chance. But the angels were trying to demonstrate that there is something that's going to happen through the life of this baby. That all of those things that used to disqualify that that still could disqualify you, there is going to be a solution for those things. It wasn't the Sanhedrin, the esteemed religious group of that day that got the notice and the invitation. It was was just the shepherds 
I would venture to say them, those shepherds probably had something. One of them at least had one of those things on that list of things that God told Moses. If, if Aaron's sons have these, they can't, they can't be involved. They, can, they don't have access. And yet these shepherds, I know I'm probably preaching to most of you here today. You got no blemishes. You are all just perfect people who have it all together. Maybe we should trade places. You come take the mic and I'll come sit where you're sitting. Every single one of us in this place would be disqualified. Because you see, what Jesus, or excuse me, what the Lord was saying to Moses wasn't wasn't really about, ultimately, big picture, it wasn't about the specifics of that moment. What he was doing was trying to show some principles. And that you and I today would be in the exact same condition as them. Because maybe in a natural context, maybe you hear that list and you're okay. But from a spiritual context, every one of us in this place would be disqualified. All have sinned and come short of the glory of of God. I don't care how good of a person you think you've been. I don't care how good of a person you think somebody else has been. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have things in our lives that have disqualified us. And and so the principle of what the Lord was establishing in the and, and, and the sort of the exclusiveness of what he said to Moses. It was all about where he was going. Because Matthew 27. In, in essence what the Lord was saying to Moses. To tell the children of Israel is there, there, there's a veil. And there was a literal veil. In the tabernacle, that because of being disqualified for one of these reasons, they could not go past that veil. The problem was, past that veil is really where you want to be because that's where the presence of God was. That's where the Spirit of God dwelt. However, to get there then, you had to be perfect. But on the day that Jesus died, Matthew 27, and verse 50 says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. It was torn in two from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. What? was the significance of that. That wasn't just a cool little thing that happened that day. The significance was what had just happened on that cross now made it so that access... uh, I, I know I've been slow so far, but you can help me now a little bit. Access was now granted to the place that before basically nobody had a chance to get to. But because of the death of Jesus, the price had been paid. That no matter what the blemish was in your life, no matter what the mistake was that you had made, you now could have access to the presence of God to get whatever it was you had need of. Now it really was whomsoever. What he said in Leviticus wasn't just anybody. It wasn't just everybody. But he knew that eventually he was going to make it possible 
that anybody, everybody would have the access. I think the reason it was the shepherds invited, the reason the shepherds were the first to visit, is because God was trying to send a message for the rest of time. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what you have to give me. In the book of Isaiah, he says, he says, I will give you beauty for your ashes. How I'll give you the, the, the garment of praise. For the spirit of heaviness. I'll give you the oil of joy for mourning. You know, I, I, I've, uh, we, we've done yard sales through the years. And now the last, I don't know, a couple of years maybe it's been now. I've, I've used Facebook Marketplace to, um, to sell some things here and there. The problem with yard sales, the problem with, with Facebook Marketplace and other things like that is... You, you're unless it's some kind of rare treasure or whatever, but most of the stuff that gets sold, you are not going to get what you paid for it. I know some people who would rather just give stuff away, literally just give it away rather than to sell it on there because they just can't handle. the small amount of money they're getting in comparison to what they paid. We, underst we understand that. We understand that's the way it works. If I'm going to purchase something from you or if we're going to trade for something, the idea is to trade things of equal value. We, we work throughout the week trading our time and skills and, 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 and abilities to get paid, hopefully get paid in a value that we consider to be equal to what we are offering, which is not always the case. We understand that, that, that concept, but the Lord didn't say, if you want beauty from me, you got to bring me something of beauty. Oh, hallelujah. If you want something of value from me, you got to give me something that's valuable. But he says, if you want some beauty in your life, I don't need you to bring me something beautiful. I'll take your ashes. I'll, I'll take the things in your life that have been destroyed. I'll take those things and I will trade you Maybe, maybe as much as I love to scream and holler and y'all to jump up and down and run, may, may, hopefully, hopefully, maybe what's going on is there, there's somebody the Lord's trying to talk to right now. If you're if you're getting surgery, you don't want people jumping around screaming and hollering. So, I I don't believe that we we say if you've said this in prayer, I I. I'm not trying to be unkind. I don't know you have so, but but I've heard people. I, I've heard people I love and respect say they'll pray, "Oh God, I am nothing without you. I am nothing without you." I personally don't believe that. I personally don't believe that's a biblical principle. I do know, and I just read the verses the other night. I know that Paul says, Paul does say, if I don't have charity. He does say, I am nothing. But this idea that God without you, I am nothing. It clearly says in the Bible, without you, I can do nothing. But I don't know of any place in the Bible that says, without you, I am nothing. And the reason, to me, the, the basic principle behind that is, if I tell God, God, without you, I am nothing. I'm nothing. Then what I'm telling God is, everything you went through, coming to this earth, walking on this earth, dying the death you did, going through the persecution you went through, 
you did all of that for nothing. That's a big price to pay for nothing. To me, everything God did on this earth is the demonstration to prove how valuable you and I are. That He was willing to pay that kind of price for every one of us and that He was willing to pay that kind of price knowing that there would be many people that couldn't care less who wouldn't ever take Him up on what He had provided. And He did it anyway. I know we all got very mature spiritual people in this place today, but you know there's some people that if they give you a Christmas present, in fact, I've heard people get stressed out some because they knew somebody was going to get them a present. And not only did they feel pressure to now give a present in return, but they felt pressure to match the value. But the Lord says to every one of us, bring me your brokenness. Bring me your life that's been shattered by either things that have been done to you or things you've done. Bring me that brokenness and I will exchange with you something far above the value of what you think you have and way more beautiful than what you give. That's, that's what he was ultimately getting to. So when he tells Moses, here's all the disqualifications, he knew there was a point coming where he was going to take care of everything that could disqualify you and I. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 15 says this, Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them in their sins and iniquities. Will I remember no more. Anybody here today, we won't, we won't say who the person is or what category they're in in your life. But anybody here today got some memories, memories of some things somebody's done to you, bad things somebody's done? Anybody? You remember them. But the Lord says, I'm going to provide a way that I will not remember your sins and your iniquities. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, watch this, watch this. Uh, in Leviticus he says, if you've got these blemishes, stay away. Not only did he tell them that, but then there was other places where he told them, in essence, you're taking your life into your own hands. Even those who were permitted to get into that holy place really were taking their own life in their own hands. That They, they might actually lose their lives. So even those that were allowed, qualified, did what they did with reluctance. But now, now, Hebrews 10, 19, please. Excuse me, yes, 19. 
Having therefore, brethren, boldness, boldness, not reluctance, not fear, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way which He had consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say His flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us... Let us, that's you and me, that's those of us that are blemished, that's those of us that have done some really bad things, that's those of us that have had some really bad things done to us, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. Let us come boldly. If you're here today and you need salvation, if you're here today and you need forgiveness in your life, you don't have to come to Jesus hesitantly. You don't have to come to Jesus with your head tucked down afraid of what He's going to do to you. But according to what Scripture says that I've read, you can come with confidence to get whatever it is that you have need of because because the way has now been made for you to have access. I know. I don't think I've. I don't think I've succeeded at communicating to you the significance of what we have available to us. I don't think I've really been able to get it across the significance. But somehow, if you would just understand, at least in a small way, I can tell you there's no present that might be under your tree on December 25th, no matter how much it costs. You know, the, the, there's these sort of, they've become somewhat common the last couple of years. There's these, these commercials for cars. I don't know, I don't remember them always being around. But these last couple of years, there's these commercials for cars and big red bow. There's one, I've, I've seen it a couple of days ago and I was watching, a, uh, I think it may have been the other night, and I was watching a little bit of the NFL game the other night. And this, you know, this, 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 this guy, this, and this girl, they're out in this snowy field, whatever, and looks over in the distance and looked like a foot or two of snow and coming through that was this cute, adorable little puppy for him or for her. Sorry. She, oh, yeah, she swoops it up and then she looks at him with this gleam in her eye. And coming from the opposite way, plowing through all this snow, is this brand new GMC fully loaded pickup. I, I, I guess there's some homes in this nation that have the ability to go out and surprise your spouse with. But I got a feeling most of us, the way we live... You probably get killed by your spouse you go pulling up a brand new car with a bow on top of it not having gotten their approval actually what i think is funny there's an energizer commercial this year that's kind of i guess a spoof off all the car commercials and this husband and wife and their little daughter are standing outside and you you get the feeling you're about to see one of these commercials here comes a car with a big red bow Except here comes the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, I don't, and we also, we know that the value you pay for a gift is not necessarily equal to the size of it. I mean, you can get a little small box with a ring in it that can be worth a lot of money. There is no, if you get 
I mean, I know it's I know it's mostly adults and young adults and some teens. I know all the children are, but you know, let's, let's be honest. Just because we grow up doesn't mean we grow up. <laughs> Anybody here got today got something you you're really hoping you get for Christmas? Anybody? Thank God for eight honest people. The rest of you, you want to put your hand up. You know, I ain't embarrassing myself. There is no greater gift that could be put under a tree that could be given on Christmas Day or any other day for that matter than the gift of access. Paul says this. 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous... This, this kind of sounds a little bit like Leviticus, really. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. The, the uh, New Living Translation says those verses like this, Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. I would venture to say there's not one single person in this place today, including myself, that has not violated at least one of those things on that list. That means you've never punched out of work early. You've never taken lunch time on work time. On and on we could go. Bottom line is every one of us are guilty of something. And therefore, we cannot enter the kingdom. So what in the world are we doing here today? Because it says none of them would enter the kingdom. Verse 11. Hmm. And such were some of you. Now, now here's the deal. Keep that up there, please. Human philosophy, human ideology tells us whatever you were, You always are. If you ever were an alcoholic, you may be 15 years sober. You're still a recovering alcoholic. And I know the world tries to do some really good things and the world has to a degree helped some people. But, but in essence, that really is all the world can offer. The only thing the world can really ultimately do is help you keep overcoming. But the problem with that, and if the world's philosophy is the correct philosophy, we all have no hope of being saved. Because if we are what we were, then we are still those things. But such were some of you. But ye are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Paul also says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away and all things have become new. So God does not offer you the ability just to be recovering from. God offers you a brand new start. God offers you what is needed to take away everything that would keep you out of His presence. That would keep you from receiving what it is He has.
I don't think it was just so we could have some cool songs this time of the year. I don't think it was just so that churches and homes and whatever could set up nativity scenes. It wasn't a coincidence. It wasn't just a cute little thing we know about. It wasn't just a trivial fact to know the story of the shepherds. It was God sending a message that's saying, what started here in this manger is about to turn everything around. Because really all throughout the Old Testament, in a lot of ways, there was really no better option than just being a recovering whatever. Because all of the sacrifices that were made, all of the animals that were sacrificed, couldn't take away sins. Couldn't wash away sins. I, I understand from a human perspective. I fully understand from a human perspective. What I am saying here today doesn't make sense from a human perspective. But what's most important is not a human perspective. What's most important is the perspective of this book. You are washed. How are you washed? You're washed by baptism. You're washed by being baptized in Jesus' name, fully immersed, not just sprinkled, but fully immersed. And I, I've, I've said this many times, and I'll say it many times in the future. It never ceases to amaze me. It never ceases to excite me when someone else gets baptized and they come out of that water and, and they don't even know that somebody else has already said this they haven't heard they're not just repeating what somebody says but they come up out of that water just water they're back there it, it looks really nice we've got people that have done a great job making it look nice but all that's in it's only a it's a horse trough that's got tap water in it we didn't import water from the Jordan River. We had just, just water. Because it's not really about the water, it's about the act of faith when you do. And people come out of that tank and say, I feel so clean. And again, I, I'm not trying to be gross here, but I'm just I'm just trying to make a point. There have been, we got a great filtering system and heater and whatever now. There's people here you got baptized in the building where you put your foot in that water and suddenly had stammering lips. That water was so cold. <laughs> Sit down in that just tank and used to. Used to we didn't have filters and Still had some heaters that we didn't have filters. And for safety's sake, there was a, well, there still is, but there'd be, back then it was just like a piece of plywood. You couldn't see through it. You'd cover in that horse trough. It was always a great adventure for the person doing the baptizing to pull the lid off and see what we're going to see today. Again, I'm really not trying to be gross, but I'm trying to make a point here. There were times that the lid would get taken off and there would be like a film. And in that moment, if you're the person doing the baptizing, you start praying. These are biblical prayers. Elijah prayed it so we can pray it. Lord, blind them. Lord, blind them. Lord, please don't let them, please don't let them see what this water looks like. And I've seen people come out of a relatively dirty tank of water and make that same statement. Or the other one that's fairly common is, I feel like a load has been lifted. I'll never forget my other son. If you're a guest today, this is my youngest son, my youngest child, 18-year-old man-child. <laughs> my youngest son was, I think, six when he got baptized. Six years old. 
had the privilege of baptizing him. And when I brought him up out of that water, he just instantly burst into tears, crying and praying. And we were walking down the stairs right over there after the service. And at six years old, he said, Dad, what's the deal with that water? It was like magic. It's not magic, but it's pretty cool. Because again, it may just be water in a tank, and but it's in obedience to this. And something supernatural happens. I, I've said this, I'm trying to quit. I got five minutes and all the hor- all the cars are about to turn back into pumpkins. And... But the struggle is that you and I have is there is no place, there is no place in this book that tells you and I that we will ever forget what we've done. No place. There is absolutely no promise in this book that says you, when you're forgiven, will never remember what you did. It's not there. And there's actually no promise that the devil doesn't remember. In fact, apparently he does because I've experienced moments when I was in a place of prayer or worship and all of a sudden this little voice starts talking to me, reminding me, how can you be worshiping? Don't you remember what you did? How can God love you? Don't you remember the mistakes you made? And basically our natural reaction to that is because we remember we automatically are assuming God remembers. But the amazing thing is, the one who doesn't forget anything, the one who has the ability to not forget, I I find myself getting more and more forgetful, and it is so frustrating. God never, God's memory never diminishes. He has the ability to remember every single thing for all of time. And He chooses that when He forgives you, He forgets. So when you are forgiven and God looks at you, He does not see the past. In fact, I would tell you today, God is not really all that concerned necessarily. I'm not going to say He isn't, but He's not all that concerned by the present. Because the Scripture says God looks at things that are not as though they were. So rather than God looking at you and getting all worried about your failures and struggles in this moment, God looks at the outcome that if you will allow His Spirit to work in your life, if you will allow His blood to work in your life, you may be here right now, but He knows where He's taking you to, and that's what matters the most. I want you to, if you're standing, you can stay standing. If you're seated, you can stay seated or stand if you want to but what I want to ask everybody to do right now is to close your eyes bow your heads I I, there's some of the feelings and emotions that I, I like when I preach I'm not feeling them but I'm believing again maybe the reason for that is is because some of you need You need to know this is not about an emotional hype today. This is not just about emotion. It's not just about the feeling of a moment. But it's about what the Word of God makes available to every one of us. So if you're here today, if you're a guest, or if you are a faithful member here, 
the manger is sending a message to you today. You are welcomed. And that whatever the things that may disqualify you, whatever the things are that may be the obstacles to keep you from the access to His presence, it's all been taken care of believe there's some people in this place today that God wants you to leave here. Some of you, maybe you've never repented of your sins and asked God to forgive you of your sins and wash them away. That can happen today. There's no better day than today. There's no better moment than this moment. I think there's also some people in this place today, you, you already really know what I'm preaching today. You, you, you can explain it as well as I can, but your struggles, your failures, your mistakes have caused the enemy to get you to question and doubt. But the Spirit of the Lord is here today to let you know the same blood that washed you the first time is the same blood that can wash you the next time. So as heads are bowed and eyes are closed again for no other reason, just kind of out of respect to others around you, I want to give an invitation to some people this morning to get up out of your seat and make your way down to this altar. I know it's easier, and sometimes we don't do it that way. It's easier maybe just to sit where you are, but there's something about taking that step because it demonstrates some faith, it demonstrates some confidence in what God is going to do. So I'm inviting you to come right now. There's some people in this place today, I believe, that God wants you to leave today with the peace and the assurance that you're not disqualified from His presence. You're not disqualified from what He has for you. But He's done everything necessary to make a way. He's done everything necessary to give you access to His presence spirit in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus We've got a few folks that have come to the altar if you don't need to pray respond for yourself this morning would you be sensitive to the spirit of the Lord to minister to others in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus Father, I pray that you would touch hearts and minds today. Touch hearts and minds in this place, Lord. By the power of your Spirit today, God, in Jesus' name. The voice of the enemy be silenced voice of condemnation and accusation in our lives be silenced because you've made a way God you've made a way you've made a way when there didn't seem to be a way you've made a way when I didn't have a right to have access you paid the price When I was disqualified, you did what was necessary to provide a way. In the name of Jesus, you came and changed my life. Oh, yes. You thought I was worth keeping. Thank you, Jesus. So I could be whole. So I could tell everyone. That's what he's done for you today. He's provided the way for you to be free. He's provided the way for you to be whole. He's provided the way for you to be clean. No matter what you've done, no matter what mistakes you've made, you sacrificed your life, Lord, for me. For us. Thank you for it, Lord. 
Thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for it, Jesus. Thank you for the access you provided us, God. Thank you for the invitation you've given us, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for removing every obstacle, every hindrance. What you've done, he's you came thought you were worth life. saving. Doesn't you matter what mistakes you've made, he me. thought you were worth it. You cleaned me up inside. You thought I was Doesn't matter how life. broken you think you are, he thought you were worth it. You sacrificed your life. Oh, yes. So I could be free, so I could be whole. Oh, thank so you for it. to be in a hurry. Receive everything you need from the Lord this morning. Hallelujah.